Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MIT SDM Systems Thinking webinar series. I'm here with our technical guru, Eric Ferris, and um, we are delighted to uh, host this meeting today on addressing patient wait times. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping items. Please make sure that your computer is muted throughout, um, and if you have any questions, please type them directly into the chat box and um, address them to everyone. I will read them aloud during the Q&A section. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to welcome our attendees and give you all a little bit of sense of uh, who your fellow listeners are. We have folks from Memorial Sloan Kettering, from the Mayo Clinic, from the Providence Health and Services System, the University of Arizona Healthcare Network, um, Austin Children's Hospital, MIT Medical, Partners Healthcare, Beth Israel Medical Deaconess, from Merck, KPMG, Oliver Wyman. We have folks um, from Duke University, Sydney University, um, Emory, um, Northeastern, and because of the nature of our presentations, which are to present the information in ways that other industries can also apply. We also have um, registrations from Lockheed Martin, Airbus, Ford, Boeing, and others in industry. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce um, an SDM student and an SDM alum, SDM alum Dimitri Leon and SDM student, and also Harvard student, Ali Camille. And with that, I turn the meeting over to them. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, this is Dimitri uh, Lyon. I'm going to share my desktop so you guys can see the presentation. Thank you very much for joining. Um, so today, uh, uh, me and Ali are going to present uh, findings uh, that um, are sort of the culmination of uh, about an eight-month study uh, with L.V. Prasad Eye Institute. Um, the study started as part of the MIT Global Health Lab, which is focused around pairing, uh, pairing students with um, various institutions, startups, and hospitals uh, in developing markets all around the goal of um, sort of tackling challenges, management and operational challenges of global health delivery. Um, so the, um, the work with uh, Global Health Lab was about um, a six-month study that included um, uh, kind of a lot of, uh, a lot of theoretical class work as well as going to the field and working with specifically LV, LV Prasad Institute, who was the uh, client uh, for our group. Um, and then there was a lot of post work. So I'm going to go through that uh, in our slides. Um, the agenda of the presentation is to give you a bit of a con uh, context of LVPI, um, then go over the opportunities and motivations for the project, as well as the approach that we've taken, uh, some general observations, recommendations and analysis, as well as the next steps and ongoing work um, that is still continuing to date. So LVPI really stands for LV Prasad Eye Institute. It's a nonprofit organization that is focused uh, solely on delivery of eye care to patients at all levels of um, economic pyramid. As you can imagine, India has um, quite a bit, uh, a, a huge proportion of um, uh, poor population, and um, LVPI is, is, is really focused on making sure that they um, really provide care to everybody. They, they don't close doors for anybody, and, and they sort of have uh, have a model where um, the the people that can afford sort of sponsor people that cannot. Um, the structure of LVPI is really um, um, focused around uh, having as, as many touch points as possible and covering sort of the, the large territory in and around Hyderabad. Uh, we specifically worked at uh, the Center of uh, Excellence um, in LVPI that really is sort of 
the main center that has uh, the largest amount of capacity um, to provide um, all levels of services, including comprehensive patient care, um, as well as clinical research, um, various, uh, sur uh, various surgeries, um, site enhancements and rehabilitations, as well as kind of um, product development and testing of uh, various uh, diagnostic and surgical equipment. Um, so it was it was a it was a really great learning experience to kind of understand um, the understand the impact that LBI is really making to not only the um, the Indian population but also kind of eye care uh, industry in general. So just to give you a couple of stats, um, LVPI provides outpatient services to about 200,000 people. It performed 25,000 surgeries um, to date. Uh, at any given time, it trains about 250 professionals at all levels of eye care. That includes um, uh, not only sort of class work and, and seminars, but also training on, on the field. Um, it also provides low, in, uh, low vision services to about 3,000 people in general. So what were the motivations and the challenges that uh, our team um, really came up with? So um, we were engaged to, to really identify what are the bottlenecks and causes of uh, high patient service time in LVPI. That was sort of the main um, crux of the project. It's really because of such a huge volume uh, of patients that go, um, go through uh, an institute in a given day, uh, the patient service times went anywhere from um, two hours to uh, to eight hours in a given day. So really understanding how can we um, uh, tackle some of the challenges of unpredictable demand demand patterns. Uh, one of the uh, main challenges there is that there was a, a pretty big proportion of uh, walk-in uh, patients that come through the clinic. So it's, it wasn't just restricted to the appointments, but uh, from from about um, 7 a.m. to uh, about 12 p.m. The clinic was open for walk-ins, um, which uh, basically meant that uh, anybody that walks into the clinic would be seen in that given day. So that really um, introduced unpredictability in the demand patterns in a given day. Uh, what we found there and what, uh, is that there was no real established uniform process um, of kind of um, in the given patient flow system. So each there were about seven different clinics, and each clinic was managed uh, slightly differently, and and therefore, um, you know, it was it was challenging to to kind of understand um, how different factors contributed to overall patient time. Um, so, really understanding some of these some of these factors, how what um, what we've also found through interviews that there was that there was a high provider fatigue um, due to the fact that um, most days there was a pretty high patient volume. And sort of because because of the fact that um, LVPI had a policy of not turning away anybody, um, the that that really meant that the days of service uh, were extended um, to uh, to all the way from from basically starting opening the doors at 7 a.m. and really not closing them uh, until until 8 or 9 p.m. on some days. Uh, there was a pretty high turnover of doctors and staff, um, which was also challenging to deal with. Um, so, so that those were sort of those were sort of the the main challenges that we looked at. Uh, the motivations and opportunities uh, they really include identify, identifying what are some of the bottlenecks in the system. Um, what really sort of the approach that we wanted to take is really figure out how we can map out the system. How can we really understand uh, the different touch points um, that the patients go through in a given day? Um, and, and, and really see where where the leverage points in the system systems are, where the bottlenecks, how can we really improve efficiency and allow LVPI to, to cater to, to more patients in a given day. Um, so um, just to give you the uh, the structure of the approach, we had the pre-trip study that really involved um, doing some research on um, uh, patient care in general and, and, and the research that was done on, on understanding and studying uh, patient times. We also interviewed um, key personnel at uh, various hospitals in the Boston area, including Mass General um, Hospital, uh, uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear, um, as well as Mount Urban Hospital. Um, also 
before we actually went to LPPI, we had continuous conversations with key stakeholders at the Institute to really kind of understand what their goals were um, and to be as prepared as possible before we actually go on site. Then we, when we were on site, it was a two-week visit where we conducted uh, time and motion studies in um, two of the cornea and two of the retina um, OPD clinics. Um, we collected time stamps um, uh, that basically looked at the flow of patients, um, where in our case were really folders as they moved through the clinic, um, and really noted um, what were some of the management practices that uh, involved uh, not only managing the clinic itself, but also um, uh, managing managing patients. There was a lot of um, the, uh, intricacies involved in kind of prioritizing different folders, uh, patient folders, and really um, uh, managing them throughout the day. Uh, we've also interviewed faculty ophthalmologists and optometrists, uh, both during our time in motion study, uh, during the day that they've actually seen patients as well as post. Uh, both those days. Um, also uh, did some interviews with um, outpatient department uh, scheduling administrator that um, uh, conducted a lot of, conducted a lot of uh, appointment schedules and kind of understood what, what are the challenges that uh, they were facing. Um, and finally, we did uh, patient service studies um, where we talked to actual patients at the walk encounters to really understand um, what their motivations of coming into the to the counter as opposed to uh, scheduling the appointments. Um, then post trip, we've we've collected quite a bit of data, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. So we've done some some analysis on understanding um, some of that data and understanding the relationships between key var variables and patient service times. Um, we've also kind of compared our findings with an interview with. Um, with some of the other management practices that we've seen uh, and derive some of the recommendations that address um, sort of system level um, challenges um, of, of increases in variability in patient service times. So what were some of the general observations? This slide sort of shows the, um, the, the, the flow of patients through both retina and cornea clinics, which are the two clinics that we've observed. So at the start, uh, patients check in. Um, then their their folders are brought into the clinic and uh, waiting for the general workup. Uh, the workup is done uh, by optometrists, um, usually with some uh, guidance from uh, ophthalmologists. Um, if the patient needs a dilation, then um, usually patients are sent back to the waiting area. Uh, for the dilation to take effect, so that takes anywhere from uh, up to uh, sorry up to 30 minutes. Um, after that, there is um, consultation. And consultation is usually done by ophthalmologists, where uh, he, uh, he looks obviously at the medical history and the results of the uh, of the workup. Um, and then, um, based on whether there needs to be further investigation, uh, that really that usually involves. Um, uh, deeper diagnostic tests that need to be done through uh, very specialized um, equipment. If that is the case, then the patient is sent to uh, either a retina or a cornea investigation clin uh, clinic where the tests are actually done, um, after which um, the, the folder comes back to, uh, to the ophthalmologist. Um, there, is, there is a post-consultation review, finally a checkout. Um, so that is sort of the general flow of uh, and structure of of, of 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 the clinics and the patients through them. So, what are some of the key factors that uh, sort of we've observed impacting patient service time? So we've broken them down into four buckets. Um, there were hospital-specific factors that included sort of the commitment uh, to training of medical staff that. That was really um, a contribution to, uh, to 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 how long the patient service time would be, uh, because um, LVPI is really also a training institute. During the workups and during the consultations, there were there would be at least two to three trainees um, in the clinic that would sort of be either um, passively observing the process or 
have um, active Q&A session uh, either during the consultation or post the consultation. So that definitely slowed down quite a bit of um, um, quite a bit of flow there. Um, there is also another hospital in specific factor, obviously, sort of the, the patient volume versus the hospital capacity. Um, you know, the, the patient volume is sort of dependent on a given day as well as on uh, what clinic that was. So some, um, because um, each clinic was run by a specific doctor, um, the appointments, that the, uh, the appointment for, for, for each of those doctors depended on how many patients that doctor sees. So if, if the doctor is relatively new, then um, the, the, the appointment schedule in a given day for that doctor is quite a bit smaller than uh, a doctor that is a lot more experienced and therefore has done a lot more surgeries and, and has a lot more follow-up appointments. Um, some of the schedule-specific factors included um, sort of the, the doctor specified appointments versus walk-in templates. Um, so uh, basically the way that the appointment system worked is that there was uh, set appointments in a given day as well as slots allocated for walk-in. So anytime there are walk-in patients that are, that are coming through, the uh, administrators would look at um, appointment schedules for each of the doctors in the clinics and see if there is any um, slots available for walk-ins. And if there are, then they will fill them in. However, um, uh, the problem was is that a lot of the times the the, uh, the slots themselves were either too small or there weren't enough of them, and so administrators uh, would would sort of create slots in in given schedules to to accommodate a lot of the walk-in patients, and so that sort of led to quite a bit of unpredictability and uh, with with how long the um, predictability for the doctor, right? They, they were sort of not expecting, they were expecting only 100 patients and they would get 120, 130. Um, there were also clinic specific uh, factors that uh, sort of included how the um, the patient folders were managed, how many um, fellows and optometrists as well as facilitators were working in a given clinic. Um, facilitators, by the way, were responsible for sort of bringing in patients into the um, into the clinic, uh, into the examination area, uh, taking them to um, uh, investigation clinics. Uh, that usually there was a couple of floors between sort of the the OPD and the diagnostic clinics. Um, uh, another factor was sort of the skill level of the staff and how many sort of the proportion between the young fellows that were just trainees versus experienced optometrists and ophthalmologists. Um, the size and the layout of clinics, whether um, sort of the um, the the, uh, the diagnostics and the workup area were in the same um, in this in the same sort of floor, whether they were on separate floors, which is um, the two things that we've observed, um, and there were also uh, various patient specific factors like lack of awareness of appointment based systems. Um, there was what we observed is there was a bias for early morning arrivals. There's quite a bit of patients that would sort of arrive two to three hours before their appointment. Um, and there was also a high volume of, of late arrivals and no shows. So all of these uh, contributed in one way or the other to patient service times. So uh, this next slide is, is shows uh, a bit of the data analysis that we've done on um, on sort of the, uh, the data that we've collected when we were on site. Um, so as you can see, the average patient service time was pretty close, both for um, general and non-paying. Uh, so G, G stands for uh, general public that are uh, basically paying customers, and NP stands for non-paying customers. Um, so as you can see, the average service time uh, didn't differ that much, although um, the thing to note here is that there's quite a bit of service var variability uh, each of the days. So you can see that the standard deviation here is an hour and 37 minutes with Quite a bit of the um, quite a bit of the data points outside of that standard deviation. Uh, the next slide here we show um, the sort of the walk-in patients arrival time versus the service time. So as you can see here, for walk-in patients, the average service service time was quite a bit larger than for appointment-based um, arrivals. Uh, the average time here is about five. Uh, five hours, um, and a lot of them would walk in uh, 
quite a bit early um, in the clinic. You see uh, a lot of them are uh, before 8 a.m. or 8 at 8 a.m. Then uh, the reason why it sort of drops off uh, at 1 p.m. is that the walk-in counter is actually closed at 1 p.m. So at that point, um, the clinic does not accept any more walk-ins. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to um, Ali to give you a bit more uh, color on our analysis and recommendations. Ali? Yes, uh, thanks, Dimitri. And yeah. hi, everyone. Thanks for um, joining the, the seminar. Um, give me one second. Let me control. Um, so, uh, as we have gone through the, the initial kind of results as to how we went ahead with, uh, with looking at the, the case uh, in case of LV Prasad Eye Institute. So, we designed, uh, the next we will go through some of the analysis, the data analysis that we captured along with uh, the few recommendations that we provided uh, to, to the client or our, um, our colleagues at LVPI. The, initially, but we designed the experiment, uh, the whole uh, project in a way to to first collect the qualitative data, but also quantitative uh, data as well. So qualitative data was connected primarily through co conducting surveys. So patients who are arriving in the second counter were able to go through and we we can identify the house to when are they coming in, if they were aware of the one day system or not. Um, the quantitative data was collect was uh, was collected by looking at as as Dimitri mentioned earlier by going through uh, and following the file folder for each patient as they went through the clinic uh, to see as to what time uh, is it taking for them to go through workup, to go through dilation, and to eventually seeing the ophthalmologist, and then going through uh, the, the going out of the clinic and checking out. So we just define service time as uh, the total time um, spent by the, um, by the by the patient at the clinic. Um, Additionally, we we followed up uh, these uh, these results by utilizing some of the system dynamic system thinking principles, uh, system dynamic space modeling, uh, and simulating the the performance of um, of the LVPI uh, clinic and see what are the some of the policy levels that they can uh, they can adjust to better service their customers uh, and patients and to optimize uh, and and adhere to their existing mission that we service as many customers as possible. So, um, um, thanks, Dimitri. So, so here, um, as we mentioned, so when designing the, the experiment, we uh, specifically looked at clinics that um, adhered to um, a point-based system and clinics that did not. Uh, so, this was our initial hypothesis uh, when we were uh, in our interviews with key stakeholders at LV Prasad. to see that some of the clinics adhered to a point-based system, some of them uh, did not. They took, it was a uh, first come first serve basis, essentially. There were appointments, but, uh, they will, uh, they still looked at or did not penalize patients for not coming, uh, uh not coming on time, either coming early, too early or too late. So, uh, some of the key observations from it, uh, as we can see, is that about, uh, uh only 28% of the patients, uh, actually arrived on time. So here we looked at uh, four clinics, um, Two of them were cornea and two of them were retina. And we see that clinic one and three adhered to the point-based system and penalized patients. So if a uh, if patient arrived too early, if patient arrived too early, uh, if patient arrived too early uh, or arrived too late, I'm hearing an echo. So clinic one and three, um, uh, okay, I, it's fixed now. Um, yeah, so clinic one and three adhered to uh, appointment-based system, and clinic two and four did not actively adhere, uh, adhere to the system. So they they did have an appointment-based system, but did not actively manage it. That was there was no penalty for patients to show up early or late. And there was based on our um, survey results, there were some um, 
uh, observations that we got that they the based on um, the patient's the perception running perception was that the earlier the, you show up the the quicker the service you can get from a particular clinic and I, and we can see those uh, those patterns based on from the data that we have collected so you can see that clinic one is uh, it's, you can see the, the distribution is a lot more packed uh, as opposed to clinic four, so which is a lot more spread out. And um, so that's uh, some of the key observations that we found. And what we, um, the recommendation that we came up with for, for, for our project partners at OVPI is that have, have doctors adhere to the point based system, but that seems to, that seems to work because we'll see that clinic one has an average service time of two hours and 22 minutes. Uh, much lower than the average service time of three hours and 38 minutes. It's almost a difference of an like hour and 20 minutes. Uh, and there's, although the time deviation is the same, uh, but that's uh, the key difference that we observe from clinic one and two and between clinic two and three as well, uh, which uh, clinic one and three were adhering to on time as opposed to clinic uh, two and two and four, they did not. Um, and then there's, need, there's a need to educate uh, and uh, create uh, more awareness of an appointment based system because that's uh, something that came out in surveys as well that did not uh, exist. Um, and we will see in the next slide that that is uh, the case as well. Um, right, so uh, uh, we looked at some of the quantitative data in, the, in this slide. So this is uh, more of a qualitative data uh, from uh, 40 patients that we interviewed uh, at the, at the, at the walk-in encounter. And we can see that uh, um, there is a distinct lack of awareness um, of, of actually in the ex actually existence of an appointment based system. And uh, we have seen uh, based on our preliminary work that we did at uh, looking at hospitals such as uh, Mass General or, or Ma uh, Massachusetts uh, Eye and Ear that uh, there is a, a strict adherence to an appointment based system. And walk-ins are um, walk-ins either pay a penalty or are encouraged to. Uh, to adhere and uh, get, a, get, a, get an appointment with the, with the doctor. Because that's created a level of predictability, which is the biggest problem that we observe. So 41% of the patients tried and successfully to make an appointment. 80% um, of patients did not make an appointment at all or either were even unaware of that such a system actually existed at all. Um, so uh, I think uh, one of the one of the key, key things that we we identified was maybe the LVPI needs to have a better triage system where the walking patients, some of them may have maybe more complicated tests as opposed to some of them maybe going through just to work up for regular checkup. So it did, did not exist a triage system, which oh, there was one of the needs that existed. And we, another key finding was that from uh, uh, from looking at the survey, so that, that even if the patients who did make an appointment, um, some of the clinics, specifically the clinic two and four, as we observed, that did not adhere to the appointment-based system, that even though the appointment-based system exists, the doctors and uh, the optometrists uh, did not adhere, uh, adhere to it. So if a patient arrived early in the morning at 8 or 9 a.m. and there were many patients uh, in there, they, they were directly seen and their service time was reduced by like, almost, their, their service time was an hour and a half. That created a, a running perception that uh, that the, the earlier you show up, the the quicker your service uh, is provided. Another observation um, that we uh, that we identified um, was uh, that over 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 the course of the day, starting from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., um, we observed a general uh, reduction in the, or there's a decrease uh, in service time as we go, um, um, as we go down from, um, as we go from afternoon to, to 6 p.m. That, uh, that initially in the morning, you see a lot more, the, uh, the service time is on average stays around three hours. Uh, but as we, as we go in the afternoon, it drops to um, around two or two and a half, two or two, 20, two hours and 20 minutes, as you observe. And um, it's a, a lot of a lot of these are it might be due to the walk-in patients coming in early in the morning and dropping off after 1 p.m. But a lot of it is also due to the fact that there is a they, even though there are a lot more patients, they are still seeing uh, uh, it's, it's, it's still churned out through the clinic 
at, at an average service time, which is about three hours, and it drops off over the day. So one of the key um, items that we, we wanted to consider to what is the, what are the factors, the behavioral patterns that are contributing to this thing? So why does um, the, the service time level off at the end of the day or uh, in the afternoon? Um, and especially if, a, if, um, if patients are not adhering to a quantum based system. Um, and that's uh, some of the key factors that we wanted to, that we observed and, and explored as well. And if, if we go to the next slide, um, um, so yes, yeah, so I think one of the, uh, that's, I think one of the questions that we, we got, uh, we're getting is, did we look at the service quality as well? So yes. Yeah. So I think one of the key items that we identified service quality is, it was hard to measure, uh, um, uh, through, um, uh, to, uh, during, uh, during our study, during this, uh, this observing, because identifying if the, if the service provided was correct or not, because that's, uh, that's a, that's a, uh, outcome that could be measured over a long period of time. We were conducting study of over a four day period in the clinic. But uh, during surveys, these items did reveal, uh, they did reveal that there were some, uh, deterioration in service quality as time of day progress. So one of the, so as this slide, we mentioned that based on a survey findings, we found that practitioners were experiencing fatigue in the latter half of, half of the day. And as we, we reached the, the closing time, which was the, the hospital did not accept any patient after 4 p.m., but there was still high volume of patients that were still, uh, waiting the waiting area. So there is, there is a added pressure to um, to perform as quickly as possible, to do the work up as quickly as possible, and do the investigation as quickly as possible. Uh, um, and then we see that some of the key observations that we mentioned that you know service times are decreasing over the day, and the time of day and providers they get, tend to get fatigued. There's another uh, survey result that, that revealed was um, that specifically that. There's a lot of, uh, because of high fatigue, there's a high churn rate. There's a lot, a lot of high um, turnover at, uh, at LV Prasad Institute because they, uh, they employ uh, the key uh, surgeons and, uh, and ophthalmologists, but the optometrists, a lot, and a lot of them are trainees who are coming in, um, um, uh, coming in through the day. So these are some of the key uh, impacts, the key observations that we found from our surveys and from our uh, time in motion study. So time in motion study captured the actual quantity of data in the survey, uh, captured the qualitative data. And, uh, as you see in the bottom here, as, as one of the key loops that we identify, uh, is that as pressure builds up in the, in the, during the day, the time per patient tends to drop. That's one of the key, um, uh, system dynamics, uh, principles that we see that, you know, that the, uh, the high pressure situation leads to uh, providers and uh, ophthalmologists and, and uh, optometrists uh, cutting corners or taking as, as quickly as possible to go through uh, the patients to reduce uh, uh, the number of patients that are in the, in the way. Um, so um, using this, so the, we looked at the survey, survey data and we looked at, um, um, uh, we looked at the, uh, the the time motion study, and we employ some of the system dynamics based uh, principles. So we see that uh, one of the key um, most popular uh, loops that exist is, is the service pressure or service quality uh, information that we have observed. Um, that uh, that there is uh, that the work day tends to decrease uh, uh, the work day because it's scheduled from 8 a.m. to 5:30. That's the official timing, but the providers and um, uh, and optometrists are are have, they, they have to work until, or, or at least what we observe is that working until 7 to 8 p.m. regularly every day um, during the time that we were there. And that's uh, just to, it seems to be an established uh, um, behavior that uh, even though the standard work day, quote unquote, is 8 a.m. to 5.30, but the regular work day stands out, uh, stays out to be 7 uh, to 8 p.m. And one of the key uh, policies that Ali Prasad has is to not turn away patients who show up at the hospital. So, um, at the clinic and the hospital. And uh, that's, uh, uh, it is it's it's a noble uh, mission, but uh, what it leads to is that patients are arriving in from outskirts of the city or from villages and, and they see them, but it leads to 
high uh, fatigue pattern, uh, fatigue and um, high work rate that we have we have seen uh, in our observations and at the time over there. Um, and we, as, as mentioned, some of the key insight that we identified was there was a high, because of high pressure, uh, the situation it leads to high turnover of staff. So the average um, of during our uh, interviews, we identified the average time and duration of employment of, uh, of providers was less than, um, uh, was, was about six to eight months at the hospital. So that uh, essentially is a loss of experience that the hospital also experiences during um, every year. But the quality uh, is, is they try to adhere, and they, there's high reputation for the for the LB Prasad Institute for providing quality of service. So we 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 feel that's one of the uh, uh, potential um, uh, options to consider to look at uh, to provide to maintain the level of quality that they have. And that includes uh, I think some of the key ideas is to adherence to a point based system, consider uh, increasing uh, staff. Uh, or of doing some sort of a rotation system so that the, the key fatigue and burnout factors that we have observed during our surveys and during our, our uh, time motion studies um, can be can be tackled. Um, and identify and then so one of the key one of the questions that we got over the panel was um, that what are how do you identify what are the errors of rework that has to be done. So yeah, so we cannot do that at the, at the time, but I think it's a so it's a, one of the next steps that we have to do on the modeling perspective that could do a more longitudinal study to see how many patients who show up at the clinic are coming in uh, are are returning due to work uh, done incorrectly or they were uh, or diagnosed incorrectly. So that's something that we weren't able to identify, but one of the key observations of that could be a factor, and I think that was one of the key next steps that are, that are being handled. At the clinic at this time, um, and then we all we can also look at the um, uh, the staffing and the turnover due to high pressure environment. And cu currently, one of the uh, one of the issues that uh, the great thing is about uh, LV Prasad is that it's one of the uh, the biggest and the largest provider in the Hyderabad uh, metropolitan area. So there are. Um, there are competitors, but there, there are limited options for people. But it's one of the uh, the best service providers at low cost or free for general population. So we 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 one of the key, key next steps to observe or to look at is if there is a competitor that emerges. What is the the cross subsidy model? How will that stand up to a, a competition in the market, which is which currently is is limited. So, um, and uh, another factor that we observed was uh, the, the increase in cross uh, consultation or referrals. And uh, we saw that every, as just like uh, um, adherence to uh, uh, appointment based system, the cross consultation cases um, uh, were, were not, uh, were handled, where each clinic had its own policy. Uh, and, and the cross consultations were 10 to 15 percent, so it's not a negligible per percentage. And one of the key observations that we observed uh, during a time motion study was cons cross consultations or referrals were increasing as we went uh, uh, as we were going to the later, later half, of, uh, half of the day. And uh, um, and that is could be a factor of that that ophthalmo uh, ophthalmologists or or um, providers are aware of possible errors creeping in, so they are more and more uh, likely to uh, to refer patients for cross consultation. So it's not a, not only adds um, uh, it not only adds uh, uh, a burden to other clinics who are being where the patients are being re redirected to. It also potentially uh, redirects uh, the patients and adds uh, sort of lower service quality, a service experience uh, for the patient. So one of the so that's one of the key um, uh, items what to consider is to be aware of the cons cons uh, manage effective management of cost consultations and referrals. And identify when is the the right, what's the best practice? When is the best time? What are some of the cases to be referred for uh, for referral or cross consultation? Uh, which which we observed that uh, the criteria was limited uh, during our time.
Okay. And and finally, one of the um, another observation that we had. This is more from a, from ob from um, observations uh, and interviews with doctors. Is um, LV Prasad has a policy of um, of having regular uh, follow up with this uh, with patients. So a, a, a doctor or, or a certain pharmacologist has a repeat uh, repeat customers. That that is, the patients are asked to come back again post surgery. For follow up every six uh, every six months six to eight months, and it's a requirement uh, to be considered uh, continued uh, patient of the LV Prasad Eye Institute, and uh, that's uh, um, uh, it's more of a high level consideration that we uh, we identified was that that essentially creates a bottleneck that every patient uh, who uh, every provider who performs uh, an average provider at LV Prasad performs 500 surgeries a year. Now, uh, a lot of them, uh, as we see, that uh, their appointments are filled in with repeat uh, patients who are coming in for follow-up. Some of the follow-up may or may not be necessary, but one of because of the the, the established requirement that to stay um, to 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 have the patients be um, well, appoint, appointed with a particular provider, uh, one has to come in after every six to eight months for a repeat follow-up uh, for a post-surgery. Analysis and that creates unnecessary burden uh, on uh, on the doctors. So the doctors are not seeing uh, new patients, but are also but are handling existing patients over and over again, even if that's not completely necessary. Um, so one of the um, loops that we modeled using system dynamics analysis is uh, is that there's a, 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 a case of a Hotel California that that uh, it. The customers are, uh, or uh, patients are required to come again and again, and it will eventually uh, lead to exhaustion of the, the, the volume that a doctor can see, uh, pharmacist can see over time uh, during, the, during their tenure at the hospital. So one of the key ideas to consider is to, is to not, uh, uh, not to consider have a, um, uh, establish requirement of all patients coming in uh, for for post surgery. I think post surgery. I think there's some level of analysis that's required. I think it's a reasonable requirement, but it requires some level of uh, triage that should be uh, provided. That it, it should uh, the the time from uh, ophthalmologist or, or surgeon to look at the, the the patients if it's not completely necessary. Okay, so uh, next, what we'll uh, with last uh, part of portion of the of the presentation, we'll look at uh, how we simulated uh, the our observations on the ground into a system dynamics based model uh, to to see if we can ex exclude some of the exogenous uh, factors and just model the the functions of a specific clinic and how patients flow from each uh, uh, each for each each check in point and going through uh, going through the clinic. And where are some of the bottlenecks that might exist? So we apply the system dynamics based principle to see where are these uh, these bottlenecks are, are happening and what can be done to tackle them. Um, so uh, it's more of an eye, a bit of an eye chart, but uh, but that's uh, the model that uh, that Dimitri and I have been working for a while, and after our, our time spending time on the, on the ground. So that model. Uh, it effectively simulates the, the the flow of patients through the clinic, and what we'll do is uh, we we'll just go through some of the results and then go through the model itself. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, so um, so what we did was we we looked at some of the um, this average arrival arrival rate over time um, for for patients and. Uh, and simulated as to how many patients are arriving per hour. So one of the key, um, uh, one of the base cases that we modeled was arrive, that having two patients arriving per hour initially, and then that jumps to about 10 uh, um, or 15 patients arriving after the first hour and continuing until the 10th hour of the day. And we can see the um, the checkout rate. There is certain delay that exists. That's a base case. But uh, we also uh, simulated 
as to increasing the arrival of, of patients, and we can see that there is a, a certain drop in workup time. That is the dilation, uh, um, the, the workup that's, that's required for certain patients, that, and that continues to drop and goes to the minimum, uh, minimum that is required by the clinic. Uh, and that comes out to be about, um, about 15 minutes per patient. So even though uh, initially the, the, the optom optometrists are spending about, um, about half an hour per patient, that drops to almost half after um, if, if there is enough, uh, if, if there is a volume buildup that we see. Uh, subsequently, we also see that uh, the investigation time per patient also drops to the bare minimum. That is, uh, initially investigators uh, or ophthalmologists are spending about, uh, about 15 to 20 minutes per patient, but, uh, um, but it, it drops to, uh, to the minimum that is uh, five minutes or six minutes. Of course, these are, these are extreme scenarios, but using the model, we can simulate these, uh, these scenarios and, and see as to what are the implications of, of uh, patients arriving in bulk, like everyone arriving at one time, or patients trickling in. So that's one of the key uh, aspects that we were able to simulate and identify uh, some of the policy considerations. Um, next slide will we'll show that uh, we see that the standard workday, which is uh, approximately nine hours, quickly devolves, uh, essentially rises to 12 to 13 hours. And, uh, and complaints of burnout and fatigue during interviews were, were confirmed during the sim uh, from the simulation results. We see that uh, the work workday essentially jumps because the system, as you model, is unable to handle the, the volume that's coming in. So there is no choice but to increase the work day, standard work day to 12 to 13 hours. Um, another uh, key factor that we observed was uh, the increase in cross consultation. So as uh, patient volume um, uh, increases, uh, there is an increase, there's, there's pretty, pretty, pretty high increase in, on um, cross consultations or referrals that tend to go out of the clinic. So we see that a lot of patients, when, are, when there are a lot of uh, patients in the clinic, it, it jumps uh, to considerably, uh, um, it's, it's anomalous. So we can see that maybe there is a certain factor that does go in because there are high, uh, 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 high um, patients, uh, high patient volume in the clinic, but it also is uh, un unusual uh, based on these uh, circumstances. So, so using the, the system dynamics model, we are able to simulate and identify some of these um, these factors that we observe. So we, so system dynamics based, uh, the, the, the model that we, we quickly looked at earlier gave us an insight as to see that uh, it provided uh, quantitative evidence to the observation that we made during the time and motion study. So time and motion study we observed during four days, we identified where, how the folder moved from one uh, um, clinic to another. But we also were able to see that, um, simulate that in the model to see that, okay, there is um, there is buildup happening at workup, and that that leads to um, that leads to optometrists lowering their their standard workup time to the bare minimum to get through the patient as quickly as possible. Um, and so this model, which which is currently being worked on with LBCI uh, for further work, um, we are we are simulating uh, identifying potential policies that would that could uh, have an impact. So let's say. If we have, if everyone arrives on time, how would that uh, change the dynamic uh, of, of the system? And, and building a reputation of rewarding on-time arrivals and increasing the headcount to avoid burnout. So the, we, we, right now the, the model currently excludes um, uh, exogenous factors. Like it, it, it removes the, like certain, certain clinic having, being more popular than the other. So we could have clinic one which adheres to uh, a point based system because it's only able to do that because there is low patient volume, as opposed to clinic two, which is high patient volume because the provider is extremely popular. So the reputation effect wasn't uh, used in this uh, in the model. Um, uh, additionally, we, we didn't consider the experience level of staff. So one of the, the observations that came up during the surveys was um, the, the high uh, turnover rate or high um, attrition rate that we have at the, at the, at the institute. And uh, that, that leads to a uh, low uh, level of experience and how that impacts the service provided and how that impacts errors or any of the uh, mistakes that might be made during workup. And additionally, we, 
we looked at uh, we 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 have we are also currently looking at the bulk arrival or any of the uh, trickling effect that you know our patients arriving uh, all at once or uh, or coming in one at a time. Um, so some of the, some of these these items are the system dynamics of this model helps us uh, analyze um, uh, analyze these uh, these items uh, during the, our operation. And this work is continuing at uh, LV Prasad right now. So this was. The work that we are presenting today was done a few months ago, uh, but right now we are we are engaging with Ali Prasad again to run some of these very experiments that we are talking about right now. So uh, as I mentioned, um, well, the next uh, next steps that we are uh, that, that we are we have been working on is, is to conduct further time motion studies to include cross consultation patients to so see what is the experience of cross consultation patients uh, for when they come in. So is, are they having uh, is spending more and more time in the clinic? Um, and then we also wanted to do some of the um, studies on the diagnostics, uh, uh, the cornea diagnostics, another portion. Uh, subset of patients that are then directed to cornea uh, diagnostics. So that's a portion that we did not consider in our model. Um, um, another is to closely look at uh, what ha the experience and flow of walk-in patients um, uh, and the effectiveness of a triage uh, process for walk-in time, which does not which did not actually exist at the LV Prasad Eye Institute when we conducted our study, but uh, but right now it's being established. As to analyze how does that impact the flow of patients or or the, the bottleneck that currently exists, um, and then uh, as in one of the key questions that we are looking to answer is to to see what are the uh, the impact of patients running and uh, or coming back uh, due to incorrect diagnosis or work that was done uh, um, uh, prior to their arrival. So that would be a key item to to prove the findings that how the the fatigue. And, and high volume um, um, you know, patients that are coming in to so Alipress, how does that uh, impact service quality to see if it actually impacts any of the, the diagnosis uh, performed. Um, and, and, and build on the simulation model that we have already done to, to make it to look at additional factors um, that we, we excluded in our initial analysis. Okay, uh, and that uh, concludes our presentation. We uh, wanted to thank our uh, to see our advisors, uh, Andrew Foster, um, uh, Jan Wilkinson, um, and two of our team members who are not present today, uh, Alisa Zuzu, the CEO of, of Global Minimum, and, and Nicole Yap, who, who is at Jacaranda Health in Kenya. And with that, I, uh, I believe we can open it up for, for questions. Uh, 
Yeah. So how do we do? How do we arrange? How do we start answering these questions? Do we just go basically uh, through the chat window, or? I am reading them aloud to you. Did okay, you hear good. my announcement? Yeah. Um, so the first question was, um, hold on. What penalties were used for early arrivals? So the way um, the, the, what we've observed in the clinic, um, the penalties were simply that the um, uh, the ophthalmologist, who was the head of the clinic, would look at the patient folders uh, before they're actually seen um, and basically see whether this patient in particular came in on time for the appointment or whether this this person is uh, uh, which is an early arrival. If the person is an early arrival, then the folder goes to the bottom of the uh, of the pile, so-called uh, backlog, and basically only seen when all of the patients that came on time are seen first. While while in other clinics, um, this process was not followed at all, where basically as patient as patient folders came into the clinic, they're seen regardless of whether they're on time for the appointment later. Okay. Um, did the simulation model capture the effect of rework from prior days? In the clinics, is rework from errors made? So the, um, that's, that's a great question. We've, we've identified um, this causal relationship between um, uh, the error rate and the, and the rework. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get enough data uh, because um, all of our study um, was sort of based on one uh, observation of one day. Um, so we didn't have any records of, um, you know, say like a, a week-long re record where we can see if the same patient came in uh, in the same week or in the same month. But our qualitative um, interviews with ophthalmologists were such that um, we were told that, you know, there, there are times where ophthalmologists would look at the patient folder um, and realize, uh, that she seen this patient, um, you know, three or four days ago, and, and realized that uh, the diagnosis was incorrect, which is why the patient is back. And then, and then, kind of the realization comes. This, you know, this was most probably at the end of the day of a long day where uh, this mistake was made. But uh, uh, you know, it was it was all sort of qualitative. Of course, we weren't able to get enough data to to quantify it and, and run it in simulation. Okay, um, here's a very interesting question. How do you encourage poor patients to schedule and then adhere to the appointments that have been scheduled? Walk-in clinics are usually easier to, easier to access than those with scheduling uh, staff to negotiate. Um, is, I suspect that this is an important distinguishing factor between India and, for example, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Right. I think uh, I don't think we can completely get. Um, one of our recommendation was to adhere, uh, install an appointment-based system, but uh, we cannot completely uh, get rid of uh, or remove a walk-in uh, patient uh, counter. I think that would be uh, something that will that will always exist uh, because just the nature of the situation, as uh, uh, the questioner asked. Uh, um, but what they can do right now, which does not exist, is, um, is there is no triage system. So walk-in could be uh, a simple case of uh, a, a checkup or follow-up, or it could be a more complicated case. So that triage system did not um, exist or was not performing uh, up to uh, – it did not exist. So that was adding uh, additional volume that, that in the morning. And you could see, you can still uh, see that patients are arriving after 1 p.m. even though the walking encounter has actually closed. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there is some level of awareness that's required, um, some level of triage system that will be necessary to reduce the impact of uh, unpredictability caused by the walk-ins. But you cannot completely uh, remove it yet. I think that's a good question. Yeah, I would I would also add to that um, one of the things that we so we've done a survey of like understand uh, talking to the patients at the walk-in clinics and just to kind of get an idea of what were the reasons why they uh, went to the walk-in counter as opposed to setting an appointment. One of it was that uh, people were just not aware of the fact that you could set up an appointment with a doctor, 
um, you know, because they didn't have a phone number or that they just didn't realize that that was um, that was a possibility. The other, so so one of the one of the options to kind of reduce that volume is to kind of raise the awareness of that fund system. The other one was uh, the other reason was that because patients uh, wanted to see specific doctors, and those are usually the doctors that uh, have high volumes of, of patients um, and have pretty booked appointment systems. Uh, they were if they booked the appointment, they, that would be you know really long in advance, like maybe a month in advance that they would be able to see the doctor. But they know if they come into the walk-in counter, there's a chance that they would be able to see the same doctor that is booked um, based on that appointment system. So that was another sort of loophole that was leveraged by uh, by patients to to see specific doctors and not having to wait for uh, for the long uh, long appointment. And so one of the considerations and recommendations there was to to potentially um, isolate that and have a walk-in sort of clinic where that is separate from a point-based clinic. Uh, that is, um, you know, that way, you know, you kind of take away that bias of uh, seeing a specific doctor and, and using a walk-in counter to do that. Okay. Thank you all very much, Dimitri, Ali. Great presentation. Um, for everyone who has uh, attended, again, we will be sending you the webinar link uh, to the recording and to the slides. Uh, we will also be sending to Ali and Dimitri a list of all of your questions. So if you'd like to follow up, if your question wasn't answered, and I have to say we've had so many, uh, most of them were not answered. Um, please know that um, you can contact them later in, later this week. Um, I'd like to also invite you to our next webinar on March 24th, which will be on gap-filling organizations. It's about how to create uh, SWAT teams, if you will, to address urgent matters uh, very quickly. That will be delivered by uh, Professor Steven Spear. Again, thank you very much for joining us, Ali, Dimitri. Thank you as well. Thank you.